I'd like to welcome you on this, um, well actually if we were in Ireland, the 1st of February is usually called the first day of spring in Ireland. So if we pretend we're in Ireland, the weather has certainly cooperated. So welcome and thank you for spending uh, your lunch hour indoors uh, for this talk. Um, I'm happy to welcome you to the AOA lecture of the School of Medicine a program that is sponsored by the UVA chapter of the National Medical Honor Society, Alpha Omega Alpha, known as AOA. Our program today is titled Enhancing Male Performance. Now we picked um, the speaker by when he could come to UVA, not just that he was coming in the month that has Valentine's Day. Um, so there's, that connection is coincidental. Over the last decade, our media have become saturated with products and services, most recently pharmaceuticals, that purport to offer what's termed male enhancement. What's going on here? Is this anything new? Does it imply that many men feel they're not performing as they'd like? These questions raise some more fundamental queries. What is a male? How do males perform? What would enhancing male performance actually entail? And then other questions come to mind as well, more philosophical, sociological, and cultural in nature, including what do worries about male sexual performance mean? By whom? And what does it mean to be a man in our world? Before we get too far into this cascade of questions, much less into any answers for them, I'm actually going to bow out and turn the lectern over to men. So first, I'd ask you please to welcome Dr. Mark Mendelson, Associate Professor of Pediatrics. It's in his capacity as the faculty advisor to our AOA chapter that Dr. Mendelson will now introduce our distinguished visiting speaker, our AOA lecturer and visiting professor, the man with some answers to all these provocative questions I've just raised. So, Thank you, Marcia, and thank you for allowing us to have Dr. Richard Gutterman at Medical Center Hour. It's an honor to introduce Richard. Um, based on the bio that I have in front of me, it's really quite intimidating, but it's a wonderful chance to have Richard here for a couple of days. He'll be speaking at Medical Center Hour as well as Pediatric Grand Rounds tomorrow and Radiology Grand Rounds on Friday. Um, he is professor of pediatrics, radiology, medical education, philosophy, liberal arts, and philanthropy at the uh, University of Indiana. He has a PhD uh, from the University of Chicago. Uh, he serves as vice chair of the radiology department, as well as president of the University of Indiana School of Medicine faculty. So those are all his titles, but he also does a number of other things which I find quite, quite amazing to me. Um, he has published over 300 articles. He has written eight books, including a book coming up later in this year, 2012. Uh, so it's, it's the academic side I'm intrigued by, but getting a chance to know him as a person through our meeting at our AOA national meeting in September um, allowed me to see something special. He was a facilitator for our meeting with 30 to 40 physicians, all AOA counselors, and he managed to distill comments and questions to something we all could understand, which isn't always easy. But today I'm thrilled to have him here, and uh, his topic today is how can we enhance male performance. Richard. Thanks a lot, Mark and Marcia. It's a treat to be here. Can you hear me? Is your mic on? I turned it on. Oh. Now it's really on. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I sit on the Board of Governors of the Kinsey Institute. Uh, people of a certain age in the room may remember Alfred Kinsey and his institute. Perhaps some of you saw the uh, Hollywood motion picture starring Liam Neeson as uh, Alfred Kinsey and Laura Linney as his wife. Uh, I've been associated with the Kinsey Institute for about four years. There's absolutely no reason I should be on the board of the Kinsey Institute. I, it's, it's not an area of research or teaching of mine. Um, 
But uh, for whatever reason, I found myself on the board, and I've spent the last four years thinking about what I'm doing there. And it's changed my view of our culture. And so I've done a little work on male and female performance. And I thought I'd share with you today either part A or part B of those investigations, focusing in this case on male performance. There, there's much to be said uh, on the other side of the coin as well. But we'll focus on male performance. I'm not an expert. All I can offer you are intimations and uh, intuitions. But I hope you'll find this intriguing. My, my intent is not to convince you of anything, certainly not to inform you of anything, because you probably know about more about this than I do. But I do want to provoke our thinking. I'm worried that we educate health professionals today without paying much attention to this vital dimension of human experience and human life, at least the sort of attention I mean to pay to it today. So I'll make some prepared remarks. And as far as I'm concerned, the, the, uh, the meat of our time together will be what I hope is a lively conversation that, uh, that follows these remarks. So uh, as, as Marcia said, um, our media are absolutely rife with uh, products that purport to offer uh, enhancement to male performance. What in the heck does that mean? Enhancing me. You could ask the same thing about female performance. What would it mean to enhance our performance? Here's a crazy way to address that question. I want to talk about Dmitry Karamazov, Claude Bernard, and Tiger Woods. The first is a character from one of the world's greatest novels. The second is one of the most important uh, biological or biomedical scientists, at least of the modern era. And the third is, I think, pretty much universally acknowledged as one of the world's greatest athletes. So we begin in, uh, in the year 1880. And that's the year that Fyodor Dostoevsky published his final and greatest novel, The Brothers Karamazov. In this work, as you know, he tells the story of three brothers whose father, Fyodor, is a lecherous buffoon and has been murdered. His eldest son, Dmitri, sits in jail charged with the crime, awaiting trial. And Dmitri tells his brother, Alyosha, of a visitor who's just visited him in jail. It's a young man named Rakitin. And this young man, Rakitin, uh, proclaims a new science, a new morality, a new man. Dimitri's mulling over this, the implications of this new man. And he asks Rakitin, what will become of men without God and immortal life? If all things are lawful, then they can do what they like? And Rakitin replies laughing, a clever man can always do what he likes. It turns out Rakitin has been writing poetry, which he despises, in order to win the affection of a rich widow. Once he marries her, he will use her fortune to start a newspaper. He explains, when I get a hold of this silly woman's 150,000 rubles, I can be of great social utility. Commenting on Rakitin's ambitions, Dmitri tells his brother they have this social justification for everything they do. Dmitri complains that Rakitin is just another Bernard. And these Bernards, they are all over the place. Dmitri then turns 
to Grushenka. This is who, who's in the image on the right? Yul Brenner. Brenner. And anybody recognize great Austrian actress? Uh, that's Maria Schell in the role of Grushenka in a spectacularly unsuccessful screen adaptation of Dostoevsky's greatest novel. But she makes a compelling Grushenka. So Dmitri's talking about Grushenka, the young woman who had bewitched both him and his father. During Dmitri's arrest and incarceration, he's developed a new understanding of Grushenka and their relationship. Initially, he says, it was only those infernal curves of hers which captured me. He was captivated by her body. But now, he says, I've taken her into my soul and I've become a man myself. Who's this? Claude Bernard. What did Dimitri mean by calling Rakitin a Bernard? To find the answer, we have to, re to return to the mid-19th century. French physiologist Claude Bernard is at the height of his powers. Three aspects of Bernard's life and work merit our attention. First, Bernard was the world's leading proponent of vivisection, experimental surgery performed on living animals. He believed that, though regrettable, the suffering of animals, especially dogs, was more than justified by the biological and medical progress at fuel. Here are Bernard's words. The physiologist is no ordinary man. He is a learned man, a man possessed and absorbed by a scientific idea. He does not hear the animal's cries of pain. He is blind to the blood that flows. He sees nothing but his idea and organisms which conceal from him the secrets he is resolved to discover. Second, Bernard's vivisectionist experiments led to a number of seminal discoveries. The most important, perhaps, being the vasomotor system. Through his work, Bernard showed that the nervous system regulates blood flow. Now, we take that for granted. That was an extraordinary discovery. The nervous system regulates blood flow, producing both vasodilation and vasoconstriction. By changing nervous input, Bernard could change the diameter of blood vessels, increasing or decreasing the flow of blood to different parts of the body. Third point about Bernard. Near the outset of his scientific career in 1845, he married the daughter of a French physician. Their union was an arranged marriage. Specifically, it was arranged by one of Bernard's associates to obtain the bride's dowry, which would enable Bernard to finance his studies. The couple had three daughters, but Mrs. Bernard quickly developed a strong opposition to her husband's vivisectionist research, as did one of their daughters. Despite Mrs. Bernard's strong Catholicism, she separated from him in 1869 and subsequently founded an anti-vivisectionist society. What I'm laying out are three threads that I hope in a few minutes to try to weave together into, uh, into the first part of what I hope you'll see as a tapestry. Now we turn to our third figure, known to everyone. We fast forward to 2009, the highest paid athlete in the world, perhaps the highest paid athlete in the history of the world, is Eldrick Taunt Tiger Woods. 
Woods has held the number one position in world rankings for more consecutive weeks than any golfer in history, and has been awarded the Professional Golfers Association Player of the Year Award a record 10 times. Despite his unprecedented success, in December 2009, Woods announced that he would take an indefinite leave from golf. He only returned to competition four months later and has not won a tournament in more than two years. Currently, Tiger Woods is ranked number 23 in the world. What happened? On November 25, 2009, the National Enquirer reported that Woods had carried on an extramarital affair with a New York City nightclub manager. Two days later, he was involved in a single car collision at 2.30 a.m., crashing his Cadillac Escalade into a fire hydrant down the street from his Florida residence. At the time, he refused to account for the incident. But two days later, he did release a statement on his website accepting blame for the crash and thanking his wife, Ellen, the mother of their two children, for helping to extricate him from the car. Over the following weeks, more than a dozen women came forward claiming they had had affairs with Woods. In the United Kingdom, by the way, without admitting the existence of such photos, in the United Kingdom, lawyers acting on Tiger Woods' behalf obtained a court injunction preventing the publication of any photographs showing Woods naked or engaged in sexual activity. In February 2010, Woods delivered a televised address from PGA headquarters admitting that he had been unfaithful to his wife. He said that he formerly believed that his fame and success entitled him to do what he chose and that normal rules did not apply to him. He expressed regret for his extramarital affairs and apologized to his family, friends, and fans for all the hurt his behavior had caused them. In April 2010, the National Enquirer reported that Woods had confessed to his wife that he had cheated on her with no fewer than 120 women over a period of five years. His wife filed for divorce, which was granted in August 2010. While the financial details of the settlement are confidential, it's estimated that Wood's former wife received approximately $110 million, and they now share joint custody of their two children. Some of you may know that uh, Mrs. Woods just about three weeks ago had the family home, which they formerly inhabited together, razed to the ground. Their home in Jupiter Beach, Florida, was razed to the ground, not a stone left standing. So with that as background, let me make some remarks about male enhancement. What do these three seemingly disparate stories of Tiger Woods, Claude Bernard, and Dmitry Karamazov, a professional athlete, a biomedical scientist, and a fictional character, what do they have to do with one another? All three converge on the topic of male performance. Consider a number of commentaries that appeared in the uh, popular press surrounding the marital infidelities of Woods and other prominent men. I, I won't mention them. Commentators have suggested that the rich, famous, and powerful are merely doing what the rest of us would do 
in a heartbeat if we had the opportunity. One study indicated that no fewer than 80% of men, 80% of men, and 65% of women say they would cheat on their spouse if they knew they would not get caught. What prevents them, perhaps what prevents us from doing so, is not any intrinsic sense of faithfulness or commitment, but a lack of opportunity and fear of the adverse consequences that would flow from detection. Such attitudes are fueled by basic and widely shared assumptions about the nature of sexuality. Since the writings of Sigmund Freud, and in fact before that, many have supposed that sexuality represents a virtually irresistible force. Primal drives and forces build naturally and if denied some form of release, they threaten to express themselves in antisocial behavior, including sometimes frank criminality. Adolescents and young adults, people the age, I don't know, of undergraduate students or nursing students or dental students or medical students, uh, young adults, in particular, need some means of letting off steam. Yet passions for any particular person may tend to fade with time, leading people to seek novel outlets for these forces. As one well-known commentator put it, it is simply unreasonable to expect one person to fulfill your sexual needs through decades of marriage. So long as the sheets are clean, infidelity, it seems, is a perfectly natural and perhaps even healthful pursuit. Claude Bernard laid much of the groundwork for understanding sexuality in physiologic terms. <clears throat> in the 20th century, Alfred Kinsey and colleagues at Indiana University launched empirical studies focused primarily on the frequency and type of sexual experiences among various segments of our population. <clears throat> at Washington University, St. Louis, William Masters, and Virginia Johnson delved more deeply into the underlying biology by observing sexual intercourse in the laboratory. Men and women were arbitrarily assigned to partnerships, and a variety of monitoring devices were used to track the changes taking place in different parts of their bodies during sexual activity. By the way, they entered the room with paper bags over their heads. <laughs> the erectile dysfunction drugs we know today, Viagra, Cialis, Levitra, they were born in the 1970s when British scientists discovered different forms of an enzyme called phosphodiesterase. They correctly predicted that drugs capable of inhibiting such enzymes would have important therapeutic potential. Bernard and his heirs spawned a new means of commodifying sexuality. The contemporary market for erectile dysfunction drugs is substantial and accounts for about five billion dollars in annual sales. And those are only the legitimate sales. 
Our physiology and pharmacology, the primary means by which to understand and enhance male performance. Some scientists argue that the most real aspects of sexuality lie in physiology. We can only know what's happening, they argue, by measuring things. Changes in pulse rate and respiration. Serum concentrations of certain chemicals. And the temperature and size of certain body parts. In Masters and Johnson's laboratory experiments in St. Louis, Missouri, four out of five subjects who fail, that is, those incapable of sexual performance, were males. As biographer Thomas Mayer puts it, minute attention to clinical performance and results could return a relaxed, Saturday night endeavor into Monday morning at work. Hooked up to electrodes and the like, many subjects found that sexual intercourse lost all trace of passion and human connection. Where physiologic performance was concerned, this presented a bigger problem for men than for women. Sex became a humdrum, loveless matter, a perspective also curiously reflected in the relationship between Masters and Johnson themselves. When William Masters first hired Virginia Johnson as his research assistant, he was married and the father of two children. He was also a faculty member of the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at Washington University, St. Louis. He was the married father of two children. She was the twice divorced mother of two. Over the course of their collaboration, spending countless hours observing, measuring, talking, and writing about sex, Masters shared with Johnson his growing fear that their work posed a danger. They might be tempted to enter into inappropriate relationships with their subjects. To avoid such impropriety, Dr. Masters proposed that their revved up appetites should be directed toward each other. <laughs> As biographer Meyer tells it, he made it sound like a release valve on a runaway locomotive, a way of diverting a major explosion down the track. Better to get it out of their systems discreetly and with no detection. Besides, Masters argued, by engaging in sex themselves, they could help to discover and test out the most effective sexual techniques. Masters instructed his partner that their encounters should remain as professional as possible. And not venture beyond the scope of scientific inquiry. This attitude represented the natural outgrowth of years of sustained laboratory work, a form of sexual vivisection. The celebrated marital union of Masters and Johnson after 13 years of nearly nightly sexual encounters was precipitated, their union, was precipitated when Johnson met a millionaire, a perfume millionaire, who proposed marriage. 
recognizing that this threatened their highly successful scientific and commercial collaboration, Masters promptly obtained a divorce and married Johnson. Over 21 years of marriage, during which their sex life promptly declined, they never used the word love. Johnson forbade it because he regarded the word love as both imprecise and inappropriate. Yet, ironically, their union ended when masters fell in love. He reconnected with a high school flame to whom as a young man he had once delivered a note and two dozen roses. Decades later, he learned that she had never received that note or those roses, and he proposed marriage to her. What did he enjoy most about life with his third wife? gazing at her across the breakfast table. Dmitry Karamazov admits that he was initially attracted to Grushenka by her curves. Perhaps curves are all that some men have managed to find in a woman which may explain why their wanderings never end. But Dimitri says more, and in so doing, he illuminates another possibility. I've taken her into my soul, he says, and through her, I've become a man myself. This is the possibility that of becoming a man, that the Bernards and the Masters and Johnsons, and perhaps even the Tiger Woods of the world, have overlooked. Dmitri has not been using Grushenka for pleasure or money or power. She is not a mere one-night conquest. Instead, she is the human being with whom he wishes to share every day, to whom he hopes to devote the rest of his life. He has learned that what matters most is not the curve of a body, but the beauty of a soul. There are at least two possibilities for human longing. One is focused on curves. It seeks new adventures and attempts to spread itself widely. It is superficial, sometimes to the point of anonymity. Just think of those experimental subjects, paper bags over their heads, meeting one another for the first time in Masters and Johnson's laboratory. a place where human beings, stripped to the skin, encountered one another with paper bags over their heads. This possibility, Dimitri rejects. He can't abide its intrinsic dehumanization. He, learn, he yearns instead for engagement with the whole person, including the part he calls an image and a likeness. He's referring, of course, to the divine image and likeness, the biblical notion that every human being is made in the image of God. A relationship that touches this divine element involves 
everything we can know with the senses, but goes beyond. It ends not with the body, but with the soul, the aspect by which we most resemble the divine. Longing not embedded in the quest to know another's soul is a sham. It's not real love. Dimitri has realized that keeping to one woman is an incredibly small price to pay for knowing so much as one woman. The problem with licentiousness in its various forms, including pornography and prostitution, is not so much that it's morally wrong, but that it's humanly deadening. Marriage, Dimitri has discovered, is not a ball and chain. Marriage is a gateway to liberation. It's only through unlimited dedication that the human soul can really take flight. Knowing one woman, like knowing God, requires discipline and commitment. The key to enhancing male performance lies in recognizing one powerful truth, a truth that has almost nothing to do with physiology or pharmacology. What a man cannot find with one woman, he cannot find with two or ten or a hundred. Seeking it among those two or ten or one hundred does not bring him any closer. Far from multiplying love, spreading it around divides it up. That's it. So uh, the purpose of giving such a talk is uh, bearing one's soul, risking embarrassment, is, uh, is the hope that it'll foster some reflection and conversation that wouldn't have taken place otherwise. I'm sure I got some things wrong. I just don't know which ones they were. And I would appreciate your help in that regard. So I'm, I'm really hoping you'll have comments, objections, questions, that we can have a bit of conversation around this theme. And I have a microphone, uh, which I will bring to persons who, who wish to make comments, ask questions, um, start the conversation. And I would ask, uh, when I get you the mic, if you would please identify yourself. Hi, thank you for that talk. Uh, my name is Karen Knight, and I work in the Health Sciences Library. But I'm just wondering where you ended up. I mean, isn't He's not a man looking for, he's not looking for the same thing when they're having sex with multiple partners. Perhaps it's more that safety valve release of the moment. And perhaps they're not, I mean, they're not looking for love. You sort of equated it that they were splitting that possibility. <laughs> so embarrassing. <sir. laughs> It is embarrassing, and I wonder if that's one reason we don't talk about it very much, or if we do talk about it, we tend to focus, let's say, on the plumbing. I get to visit a lot of U.S. medical schools, and I can tell you that of the schools that cover human sexuality in the curriculum, it's generally, generally focused on reproduction, appropriate, sexually transmitted diseases, appropriate, and dysfunctions of one kind or another, infertility, uh, erectile dysfunction, and so on. Those are all very important. We very much need to make sure that future physicians are knowledgeable and possess the appropriate skills in diagnosing and treating, you know, those sorts of issues. But uh, we don't often talk about sexuality in the context of love. 
these may be young people for whom I was brought up in, uh, say, in middle school around the topics of uh, sexually transmitted diseases and, and uh, contraception. Then in college, they had a biology course where the facts of life were reviewed. Now in medical school, uh, they get more about human sexual physiology and pathology, and there's a risk that we never discuss sexuality within the broader context of something like love. And I wonder if by failing to connect those two, in fact, I hope to interweave those two, we're not doing not only our students and the future physicians of our communities, but ourselves a profound disservice. I do think there are lots of people. I, I was uh, a member of a fraternity when I was in college. I, I attended the marriages, the marriage ceremonies, of a number of my fraternity brothers shortly after I graduated from college, over a period of several years. And at several of those ceremonies, uh, my fraternity brothers gleefully took photographs of the groom with uh, a ball and chain around his ankle, which, by the way, did not endear them to the, to the bride. But, you know, the idea was this young man is sacrificing, he's forfeiting his freedom. He's allowing himself to be tied down. He's walking into a jail cell and slamming the door shut behind himself. I think there are many forces at work in our contemporary culture that would lead our sons and grandsons, our nephews and cousins, to think just that. That marriage represents uh, something artificial designed con to constrain and configure uh, male appetites in a profoundly unnatural way. Now, certainly everybody doesn't say that, but I think there are forces in our culture that would lead young men to believe that, and I think those forces need to be questioned and drawn into conversation. That uh, our sons and grandsons won't be able to be the kind of men they're capable of being unless they've read some of the right books or viewed some of the right films, and more importantly, had some of the right conversations around the connection between human sexuality and human love. Is love an epiphenomenon, ripples on the surface of a vast ocean welling up from below? That what's real is the libido, the sexual appetite, and we've managed to put some cultural window dressing on that to try to, to, to control those wayward and powerful forces. That's one possibility. No less a physician and scientist and psychologist than Sigmund Freud seemed to have thought that was the case. But, uh, <coughs> but that's not the only story. You know, there's, uh, there's the Song of Songs. There's uh, Plato's Symposium. There's the relationship uh, between Natasha and Pierre in Tolstoy's War and Peace. You see, there are other possibilities. And I think we desperately need to engage our sons and grandsons and nephews, and perhaps even our boyfriends and husbands in conversations around these vitally important themes. Because my own sense, is just speaking for myself, is that it turns out that the higher is not an epiphenomenon of the lower. But in fact, unless you understand the higher, even the lower doesn't really make sense. Boy, was that ever a circuitous and long-winded response to a very well-formulated question. I'm sorry. Hello. Um, do you believe, oh sorry, <laughs> my name is Dan and I'm from the medical school. Um, do you believe that the fundamental notion that many people have of pairs, be it man and woman, or man and man, or woman and woman, has its roots in biology or in society? 
It's a fascinating question. No less a biologist than Charles Darwin said, uh, you may know the ratio of, of, of newborn boys to newborn girls. Let's say it's one to one. It's not really. There's an excess of males, but by the time they reach reproductive age, it's almost exactly one to one. How can that be? How do you explain that the male to female ratio is for all intents and purposes, at least by the time of reproductive age, almost exactly one to one. Darwin said, imagine that human beings were like bees, or pick another species. Imagine the ratio were 10 females for every male, or 10 males for every female. Newborn human infants. He said, the structure of our society, our culture, the Bible, the Quran, would read differently from the text we know today. It's, it's hard to deny that biology has a profound impact on how we see these matters. And that if the biological facts were different, it's conceivable that our very morality might be different. I don't know. But uh, I'm impressed that it is one to one. That it does seem to be natural to us. That it does seem to take a pair of people uh, to conceive and give birth to and rear. I, I, by the way, I don't mean to slam single parents or anything like that. It just seems that there is something natural, not necessarily inevitable, not necessarily uh, something we can't uh, tolerate any deviation from, but something natural to this pair bonding thing, not only for purposes of uh, conception, but for purposes of child rearing. Uh, that's hard to deny. And uh, I, my own suspicion is that the full fruition of the human power to love takes place in that context of an enduring, in principle, permanent, and unending commitment to another human being. And, and to regard that commitment as conditional, uh, transient, revocable to see it as a contract when one party wishes to, you know, breach the contract. Uh, perhaps what we need is a less contractual and more coven covenantal understanding of marriage. Hi, my name is Catherine Reynolds and I work at the Medical Center. Um, I have a couple of thoughts went through my mind as you were giving your talk and then I have a question at the end which is sort of unrelated to my thoughts. but. Um, I grew up in a place that I call Holy Catholic Ireland, where my mother still lives, and it is the first day of spring there. Um, and um, it, it was a very sort of Catholic moral upbringing, and I was, I was raised to believe that men are, males are lecherous, and I have vivid memories of my first job as a waitress in a restaurant when I was 17 or 18 of the... Uh, um, lady who worked there, all the new girls that would come in to be waitresses in the bar, she would take off her necklace and swing it back and forth and use a dreadful expletive and she would say, repeat after me, all men are blank, all men are blank, because working in the bar you're going to be groped and they're going to hang outside to walk you home and everything else. And I didn't believe her. I thought, well guys are just like me. We're all looking for love and affection and, and that's just silly. Um, and then about 20 years ago, I was already married at the time, but I heard on NPR uh, a report about uh, truck drivers in India and how they would have this force and physiological um, volcano inside them on their long haul truck driving and so that at various stops there would be places and, and, and young women where they could release that passion. And so these thoughts were just coming through as you were talking and I was thinking, see now, that's been in my mind, even though I've always thought, no, men are really good, kind, loving people, just like we are, <laughs> and it should be able to work out. Um, but my question for you is, uh, sort of bouncing on from the previous question, is what of um, individuals in this world who feel or don't feel and describe themselves as asexual, um, I think an interesting study would be how they experience love or feel love or talk about love um, and yet don't feel sort of 
um, a sexual need or a uh, need to express it sexually or physically. Yeah, I, I referred in passing to Plato's Symposium. The, this is one of the great dialogues about Plato, uh, by Plato. By the way, it's about love. It's one of the greatest explorations of love in, uh, in world literature. Plato's dialogue called the Symposium, a word that means a drinking party. Um, in that dialogue, Socrates is portrayed as the greatest of lovers, but as someone not attracted to other people sexually. What interests him about the people he's interested in is not uh, the pleasure that can be had through their bodies, but uh, the possibility they can be engaged as uh, co-inquirers. Think of what was what was the best conversation you've ever had in your life? What was the best sex you've ever had in your life? I suspect that in the final analysis, it's that best conversation that comes closer to the truth about what we are as lovers than uh, the best sex. Now, that's a problem today because we, are, we live in an age of visual media. We need to capture things on television and on the big screen and on our uh, mobile phones visually. So we live in an age when there's an especially strong tendency to try to portray this capacity to love, this deep need for love in visual terms. Television and the big screen, not so well suited for conversation as perhaps the passionate embrace. So we're, we're being encouraged to think of it more and more in terms of something physical, what you could photograph for a magazine or capture on a YouTube video, but it may in fact be that in our own lives uh, we love the best through what we said. Hello, um, I'm Crystal, a graduate student here in the medical school. And uh, I have a question. So the guy you were talking about at the end, he was married three times. And for several years, I don't understand why he didn't fall in love one of the other times. Because he was, you know, devoted in a way through that marriage bond. Uh, and only the last time, he actually fell in love. And yeah, I, do you think that there's such a thing as soulmates? Yeah, there may be a profound difference between a sex partner and a soulmate. Not, not to say that the two can't coexist in the same person, uh, but the, those may be two very different ways of, uh, of looking at another person. And uh, I think William Masters, the obstetrician gynecologist from Washington University, St. Louis, the Masters and Masters and Johnson married three times, who forbade his second wife, Virginia Johnson, his research associate, from ever using the word love, who claimed that he did not love her, uh, he may not be our model for what we hope for our sons and grandsons or our boyfriends and husbands. Uh, but even he, after years, of sexual vivisection in a laboratory in the final chapter of his life discovered that this, <laughs> this capacity to love could be reawakened. You know, hope springs eternal. The, the, the possibility of redemption is perhaps never, final, fi, never finally lost. And maybe William Masters is uh, as good as an a, a example of that as we can hope for. Hi, 
I think I have a couple of minutes, or we have a couple of minutes. Uh, my name is Carolyn Englehart. I'm on the faculty here. I teach health policy. And I wonder if there's not a downside to idealizing love. And I want to give you two examples. The first is my brother, who at the age of 14 wanted to go into the priesthood, and my father, who was an OBGYN and subsequently actually became a Masters and Johnson's sex counselor, said no, he couldn't. But if he still wanted to, at age 16, he would let him. And then when my brother graduated from high school, he went into the seminary. Uh, 20 years later, he left, the sem he left the priesthood because he fell in love and had to um, give up his vow of chastity. That's one example. Second example is more in my world, and that has to do with health policy. And you may not know, you may not be following this as closely as I, but right now there's a big brouhaha going on because under the new health care reform bill, they're requiring all health insurance plans to offer contraception free of charge. And Catholic health systems and insurers, Catholic health systems are all up in arms saying that they won't do it. They feel like they shouldn't do it because they think contraception is terrible. Presumably because of some sense of an idealized kind of love. So I would just ask your thoughts on those things. That is a really complex question. <laughs> um, Aristotle says that the most natural thing for any living creature, not just human beings, not just animals, plants even, the most natural thing for any living creature is to reproduce itself, to leave behind one of its kind. But that's what he thought. Why did he think that? I think he thought that, that I, and I apologize for this, but this is my own interpretation. I think he thought that because he thought that one of our missions as living creatures, not just as human beings, but as living creatures, is to participate in as far as we can in the eternal. In other words, you and I, in our brief span of life, four score years, whatever, we are trying to participate in the eternal form of the human, to, to bring the human possibility fully to life to the extent possible. Reproduction may be one way we do that. But it's possible that we can reproduce, as Socrates would have said, we can reproduce not only in bodies, but in souls. Here's a crazy idea. One way you're going to participate in the human form, let's say, is by uh, being a parent. Maybe, maybe not, but let's say that's so. Being a parent, having a son or daughter, children. Another way you're going to participate in human form is by writing the best love letter you possibly can to another human being. Trying to give the fullest expression you possibly can to your love for another human being. Uh, this isn't even directly addressing your question, but if you think of love in those terms, that that's the highest and best expression, could be a conversation, wouldn't have, but let's say a love letter, that that is the star by which we steer in matters of love. I, to me, at least, that sets this debate over contraception and reproductive rights and so forth, that puts that in a very useful and illuminating con context. I recognize that's a pretty cryptic remark, but doggone it, I think it's true. <laughs> I'm afraid I'm going to have to put an end to this very interesting and wide-ranging conversation. We've come to the end of our time. Um,
Before we thank Richard Gunderman, I'd like to invite you to come back next week for a, a, a program that follows a little more on Carolyn's second question. Uh, this one is called Healthcare 2020, Your Practice, a Disruptive Prognosis. We are having a healthcare consultant, Gary Feilerman, and our own uh, vice president and hospital CEO, Ed Howell, uh, here for what we think will be a candid and provocative conversation. Um, please join me in thanking Richard Gunderman for a, a marvelous um, hour, um, really on enhancing human performance. Thank you. Thank you.